My father died of Lewy body dementia, a particularly cruel form of the disease that ravages body and mind. By the time he passed, my dad was a shrunken shell of a man and we watched him shrink week by week, month by month, year by year, quietly folding like an ever thinning piece of paper until at last he lay in an aged care room, a scrap of a man, a shrunken dad in a shrunken bed in a shrunken room, surrounded by a shrunken life, some books he'd never read, a stack of Johnny Cash, Elvis and Charlie Pride CDs, a photo of my mum in her 20s. Louis body dementia is hard to bear and hard to watch. It does not merely shrink one's brain, it shrinks all of you piece by inexorable piece, and it does you slowly. In the early stages of the disease, the signposts in my father's life began to disappear. The neural pathways and the actual pathways began to grow over. He lost his train of thought. The last time he drove, he got lost in a nearby street. We knew, he knew, something was wrong. He was struggling to find his relational bearings, his emotional bearings, his historical bearings. He had moved to a foreign land, a land with no signposts. And as his condition worsened, even the landscape in that foreign land flattened, flattened into a grey, misty marshland at low tide. We packed his flat and found him a high care room. His life was then metered out by sippy cups at breakfast, mashed foods for lunch, and bedded down by 6 p.m. Launder, rinse, repeat. No signpost is one thing, perhaps you can find your way back. No familiar landscape behind or ahead of you is another. So too, inevitably, with my father. I was driving to his aged care home when I got the call that he had died. I'd seen him the night before, knowing it was not going to be long. His body lay on the bed, even more shrunken than I could have imagined. The staff had placed a red rose, a real red rose dying itself by now, between his hands. I took a picture, not a selfie. I needed one last thing to remember him by. I did not want him to be forgotten. Now, in his own way, his life was forgettable, very much so, actually. But I was not going to forget him. Me forgetting him would mean forgetting so much of my own life, too. Not just the big stuff, the granite chunks of migration and family holidays and parents divorcing, but the small stuff, the pebbles and sand that filled the jar, the cheese sandwich he made every day for work, the one and only time he bought a new car, ABC radio blaring out The Goon Show as he framed pictures in the shed on Saturday mornings. He had forgotten all those things. But for me to forget that, that would somehow involve me in his dementia, and I didn't want to forget. The late Australian cultural commentator, Clive James, wrote a book called Cultural Amnesia, a huge tome of essays about the greats of Western literature and life. His concern? That we would forget where we had come from, that we would form a collective cultural forgetfulness, half accidentally and half deliberately. And in doing so, we would lose not only our sense of historical identity, that's bad enough, but that we would forge forward with no signposts into a cultural landscape without direction, without meaning and purpose, and without warnings. For that's the thing about signposts. They not only tell us where to go, they tell us where not to go, what to avoid. Warning, dangerous cliff, loose cliff face, or sharks have been sighted off this coast. There's a sense of adventure in going off the beaten track, isn't there? That much is true. But there's a sense of panic when the track then peters out and we can't find our way out. But cultural amnesia is not cultural dementia. With amnesia, there is hope. Often there is a way back. And Clive James offers us a way back in his book, or more to the point, a way through, rerouting neural pathways, rebuilding memories. And this is not about nostalgia. We don't want the past but we do need to learn from it, build upon it. History is both signposts and warning signs. Lose the former and we are reduced to reactionary fear, but lose the latter and we are seduced by revolutionary zeal. Lose both and our cultural amnesia will descend into cultural dementia from which there may be no coming back. Reactionary fear and revolutionary zeal. I look around, we have both. Extreme nationalism on one hand, 
gleeful, hot cancel culture on the other. A call to return to the historical institutions that built us and realise that they shape us in many positive ways, or a rejection of those institutions. A call to tear down. Iconoclasm marked by ropes and pulleys, angry red paint and masked protest. To create a new history, starting today or tomorrow, but no later and certainly no earlier. Cultural dementia, it would seem to be then for us, isn't it? Is there a way forward? A way to honour the past without photoshopping out the ugly bits? A way to look our history in the face with no filter? To acknowledge its good and its ills? I believe this is our important cultural task and I want to offer three reasons for this. And here they are. Cultural dementia will make us poorer. Cultural dementia will make us vulnerable. And third, cultural dementia will make us dangerous. Now, first of all, cultural dementia will make us poorer. Australian singer-songwriter and increasingly cultural icon, Nick Cave, worries that we will lose something deep, rich and creative in our zeal to push aside those parts of history that chip our self-aware modern sensibilities. He warns against the retrospective cancel culture that has seen books by the likes of Southern Gothic author Flannery O'Connor removed from libraries across the USA or slapped with bands. Listen to what Cave says. It's wise to hang on to the things that are self-evidently good for the world, especially culturally. There are stories of wisdom and beauty in the world worth protecting, even if they don't chime with the prevailing mood. We will always move forward. That is the nature of an essentially progressive society, to renew and to build upon and also to critique and discard. Not every new idea is a good idea, nor is everything we get rid of in our deification of the new. Things are not easily retrieved when they are gone. They remain lost. Great quote. <laughs> Cave believes art should baffle and outrage us as much as confirm us. Surely without baffle and outrage, all we have left with art is propaganda. And that never goes well. Perhaps that's the reason why the top tier of our wedding cake is still in our fridge. It takes up space and certainly looks less celebratory than it did 26 years ago. I'm so tempted to throw it out every other week. Now, I've been married for nearly three decades and there are days, as Cave would observe, that don't chime with my prevailing mood. But every time I open the fridge, they're among the encrusted sauce bottles, the margarine, the wok in a box, and the half tub of yogurt that should have been thrown out last week, is a sweet, gentle reminder of a wedding feast that still continues to richly feed my life. Elvis Costello, another great singer-songwriter, called it useless beauty. What shall we do? What shall we do, he asks, with all this useless beauty? Well, perhaps we should revel in it and enrich our lives with its sheer existence, even if it is inconvenient to our modern sensibilities. If we throw it out for the sake of propaganda, we will be all the poorer for it. Cultural dementia, secondly, will make us vulnerable. The decline of religious observance in Western society has tracked with the rise in mental health conditions, especially anxiety. Now, is this causation or merely correlation? Granted, there are other contributing factors, but it's become clear that the steady decline of historic religion, its decrease in observance and the sheer ignorance of religion among younger generations is not leading us to the utopian, atheistic ideal promised even two decades ago by the likes of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. In fact, religious decline is not being replaced by atheism. It's been replaced by a search for something that will hold the weight of our desires, for something more. Turns out consumption, white goods, holidays and Botox, isn't quite cutting it. The loss of our collective history, good and bad, will lead to us falling for ideas and ideologies that were rejected in the past, but which come to us fresh, new, inviting and innocent. I walked past a young woman wearing a T-shirt with a large hammer and sickle on it the other day, a symbol of brutality and oppression in the Soviet era. For me, it would be the equivalent of wearing a swastika, but not for her. Perhaps she was wearing it ironically, but I am not so sure. But does she have any idea about the past? 
the brutal past of gulags and Stalinism that led to the deaths of millions? Perhaps, but perhaps not. The fall of the Berlin Wall is still etched in my mind. 1989, the sight of thousands of East Germans pouring over the fallen rubble into the West was startling and beautiful. As beautiful as the hammer and sickle is now ugly. Ugly to me at least. <laughs> Without historical context, it becomes a stylish plaything worn by a young woman at the checkout in front of me, guiltlessly buying her lunch on her way to university. What if totalitarianism sidles up to us once again, all allure and promise of a better future? What if the body count is airbrushed from history? What if the lack of any historical understanding means it does not need to be? What if 20 million deaths is merely a number to be rounded up or down in a footnote in a history class? And what if racism returns this time with a smiling face? What if in our zeal to purge the world of the villains of the peace, we purge it too of those flawed heroes whose own villainy seems so obvious to the cultural zealots today? Which brings us to our final observation. Cultural dementia will make us dangerous. Let's put our heads together and start a new country up. Our fathers, fathers, fathers tried. They erased the parts they didn't like. Now that's a line from my favorite 80s, 90s band, REM, and their song called Cuyahoga. The Cuyahoga is a river in the United States that became so polluted by industrial waste that it actually caught fire. Imagine that, a river of fire. The song is called for a reset, a total national reset of how we go and where we're headed. The US ancestors of the songwriter erased the parts of history they didn't like, including the indigenous Americans, a stain on their history as much as the Cuyahoga fire was. In the words of the song, that river had run red before, red with the blood of people, people deemed unsuitable for the future vision of the country. Now we all long for a better country, a new one, the chance to put our heads together and come up with one, a fresh sheet of paper. We long for a year zero. Year zero. That's the term that the Cambodian tyrant Pol Pot employed in his genocidal remake of a nation. Year zero led to the killing fields and the pyramid of skulls on display in the museums. Year zero, cultural dementia, call it what you will. But it risks us repeating the mistakes of the past by erasing not just ideas, but erasing people too. Now let's return to Clive James. He says that after the bloody history of Hitler, Stalin and Mao, he puts it like this, not even Pol Pot came as a surprise. Sadly, he was a cliche. Well, a cliche, but only if you remember the past. And if you don't, then it's a way to start a new country up. A new country built out of the morass of racism, nationalism, and all of the other isms that chafe with your own ism. And what is that ism? Probably idealism. <laughs> There's a cheerful optimism among all of the iconoclasm we're witnessing. The rush to erase history is optimistic and idealistic. Those carrying it along cannot see the sick seed within their own hearts. Clive James cautions the current generation with these words. Ours was an age of the extermination, an epoch of the abattoir, but the accumulated destruction yielded one constructive effect, salutary even if solitary. It made us think hard about the way we thought. Now, cultural amnesia stops us from thinking hard about the way we think. Cultural dementia stops us from thinking hard about the way we act. The abattoir may one day reopen. It already has. The war in Ukraine is proof. Prior to the war, there were any number of surveys showing that a younger generation no longer felt that democracy was all that important. That old thing. They were confident that there was some other option not yet explored. It was instructive, though, how quickly they scurried back under democracy's wings when the YouTube videos of frontline destruction cast their shadows over the chicken coop. Do we really want another extermination to make us think hard? I hope not. And yet, 
And yet there's a, there's a yearning inside us for a fresh start, isn't there? A positive version of year zero or month zero or day zero. We want to know if one is available and we swipe left or right, we delete our search history, we do a January 1st on March 23rd, July 17th, October 6th. We desperately don't want to bring the bad bits of our history with us. We seek the approval of others on the basis of a continual cycle of year zeros. Is there a way out of this beyond becoming history ourselves? For one day, rest assured, like my father, we will all lie shrunken. They will pack us up and pack us in and we will be forgotten. First, amnesia, as the signposts of our lives gradually fade, even among those who love us. And then eventually, dementia, as they too fade away and all that is left is the grey mist and overgrown trails. The hope of history is actually counterintuitive. It is found in the one who created history, the Lord God who sits above it, according to the Bible, the God who knows the grubby parts of our past, individually and collectively, yet took the risk and stepped into history in the person of Jesus Christ. Not to erase the parts he didn't like, but to redeem those parts, individually and collectively who went to the abattoir of the cross in a story of wisdom and beauty to the world. Jesus did not chime with the prevailing mood of his time, nor does he chime with the prevailing mood of our time either. But despite its best efforts, history can't seem to shake him loose, no matter how hard it has tried. Perhaps it's because he won't let go of history either. And in an age of cultural amnesia, that risks becoming an age of cultural dementia, that at least is worth remembering.